Book Two, Part Four of the Histories by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Histories by Publius Cornelius Tacitus, translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Brodrib. Book Two, March to August, A.D. sixty-nine. Part four. About the same time news came to Vitellius that the procurator Albinus had fallen, and that both the provinces of Mauritania had declared for him. Lucaeus Albinus, whom Nero had appointed to the government of Mauritania Caesariensis, to which Galba had subsequently added the charge of the province of Tingitana, had the disposal of no contemptible force. He had with him nineteen cohorts of infantry, five squadrons of cavalry, and a vast number of moors, a force trained to war by robbery and plunder. When Galba had fallen, he was strongly disposed in favour of Otho. He even looked beyond Africa, and threatened Spain, which is separated from it only by a narrow strait. This alarmed Cluvius Rufus, who ordered the tenth legion to approach the coast as if he intended to send them across. Some of the centurions were sent on before to gain for Vitellius the good will of the Moors. This was no difficult task, as the fame of the German army was great in the provinces. Besides this, a report was circulating that Albinus, scorning the title of procurator, was assuming the insignia of royalty and the name of Juba. The tide of feeling turned, and Asinius Pollo, one of the staunchest friends of Albinus, prefect of one of the squadrons of cavalry, with Festus and Scipio, prefects of two infantry cohorts, were killed. Albinus himself, who was sailing from the province Tingitana to Mauritania Caesariensis, was murdered as he reached the shore. His wife threw herself in the way of the murderers, and was killed with him. Vitellius made no inquiries into what was going on. He dismissed matters of even the greatest importance with brief hearing and was quite unequal to any serious business. He directed the army to proceed by land, but sailed himself down the river Ara. His progress had nothing of imperial state about it, but was marked by the poverty of his former condition, till Junius Blysus, governor of Gallia Lugdunensis, a man of noble birth, whose munificence was equal to his wealth, furnished him with suitable attendants, and escorted him with a splendid retinue. A service which was of itself displeasing, though Vitellius masked his dislike under servile compliments. At Lugdunum the generals of the two parties, the conquerors and the conquered, were waiting for him. Valens and Caecina he put by his own chair of state, after celebrating their praises before a general assembly. He then ordered the whole army to come and greet his infant son. He brought him out wrapped in a military cloak and holding him in his arms, gave him the title of Germanicus, and surrounded him with all the insignia of the imperial rank. It was an extravagant distinction for a day of prosperity, but it served as a consolation in adversity. Then the bravest centurions among the Othonianists were put to death. This, more than anything else, alienated from Vitellius the armies of Illyricum. At the same time the other legions, influenced by the contagion of example, and by their dislike of the German troops, were meditating war. Vitellius detained Suetonius Paulinus and Licinius Proculus in all the wretchedness of an odious imprisonment. When they were heard, they resorted to a defence, necessary rather than honourable. They actually claimed the merit of having been traitors attributing to their own dishonest counsels the long march before the battle, the fatigue of Otho's troops, the entanglement of the line with the baggage-wagons, and many circumstances which were really accidental. Vitellius gave them credit for perfidy, and acquitted them of the crime of loyalty. Salvius Titianus, the brother of Otho, was never in any peril, for his brotherly affection and his apathetic character screened him from danger. Marius Celsus had his consulship confirmed to him. 
It was commonly believed, however, and was afterwards made a matter of accusation in the Senate against Caecilius Simplex, that he had sought to purchase this honour, and with it the destruction of Celsus. Vitellius refused, and afterwards bestowed on Simplex a consulship that had not to be bought with crime or with money. Tracalus was protected against his accusers by Galeria, the wife of Vitellius. Amid the adventures of these illustrious men, one is ashamed to relate how a certain Maricus, a boyan of the lowest origin, pretending to divine inspiration, ventured to thrust himself into fortune's game, and to challenge the arms of Rome. Calling himself the champion of Gaul, and a god, for he had assumed this title, he had now collected eight thousand men, and was taking possession of the neighbouring villages of the Aedui, when the most formidable state attacked him with a picked force of its native youth, to which Vitellius attached some cohorts, and dispersed the crowd of fanatics. Maricus was captured in the engagement, and was soon after exposed to wild beasts, but not having been torn by them was believed by the senseless multitude to be invulnerable, till he was put to death in the presence of Vitellius. No further severities were exercised on the persons of the opposite faction, or with property in any case. The wills of those who had fallen fighting for Otho were held to be valid, and with those who died intestate the law was carried out. Assuredly could Vitellius have bridled his luxurious tastes, no one need have dreaded his rapacity. He had a scandalous and insatiable passion for feasts. The provocatives of gluttony were conveyed to him from the capital and from Italy, till the roads from both seas resounded with traffic. The leading men of the various states were ruined by having to furnish his entertainments, and the states themselves reduced to beggary. The soldiers fast degenerated from their old activity and valour, through habitual indulgence and contempt of their leader. He sent on before him to the capital an edict by which he postponed his acceptance of the title of Augustus, and refused that of Caesar, though he relinquished nothing of his actual power. The astrologers were banished from Italy. The Roman knights were forbidden, under severe penalties, to degrade themselves by appearing in public entertainments or in the arena. Former emperors had encouraged the practice by bribes, or more frequently enforced it by compulsion, and many of the towns and colonies had vied with each other in attracting by large pay the most profligate of the youth. Vitellius, however, when his brother joined him, and when those who are skilled in the arts of despotism began to creep into his confidence, grew more arrogant and cruel. He ordered the execution of Dolabella, whose banishment by offer to the Colonia Aquinas I have before mentioned. Dolabella, on hearing of the death of Otho, had entered the capital. Plancius Varus, who had filled the office of Praetor, and had been one of Dolabella's intimate friends, founded on this a charge which he laid before Flavius Sabinus, prefect of the city, implying that Dolabella had escaped from custody, and had offered to put himself at the head of the vanquished party, and he also alleged that the cohort stationed at Ostia had been tampered with. Of these grave accusations he brought no proof whatever, and then, repenting, sought, when the crime had been consummated, a pardon which could be of no avail. Flavius Sabinus, hesitating to act in a matter of such importance, Triaria, the wife of Lucius Vitellius, with unfeminine ferocity, warned him not to seek a reputation for clemency by imperilling the emperor. Sabinus was naturally of a mild disposition, but under the pressure of fear was easily swayed. Here the danger of another made him tremble for himself, and, lest he might seem to have helped the accused, he precipitated his fall. Upon this Vitellius, who, besides fearing Dolabella, hated him, because he had married Petronia, his former wife, summoned him by letter, and at the same time gave orders that, without passing along the much-frequented thoroughfare of the Flaminian road, he should turn aside to Interamna, and there be put to death. This seemed too tedious to the executioner, who in a roadside tavern struck down his prisoner and cut his throat. 
The action brought great odium upon the new reign, and was noted as the first indication of its character. Triaria's recklessness was rendered more intolerable by an immediate contrast with the exemplary virtue of Galeria, the emperor's wife, who took no part in these horrors, and with Sextilia, the mother of the two Vitellii, a woman equally blameless and of the old type of character. She, indeed, is said to have exclaimed, on receiving the first letter from her son, "'I am the mother not of Germanicus, but of Vitellius.' And after days, no seduction of fortune, no flattery from the state, could move her to exultation. It was only the misfortunes of her family that she felt. M. Cluvius Rufus, who had left his government in Spain, came up with Vitellius after his departure from Lugdunum. He wore a look of joy and congratulation, but he was anxious at heart, for he knew that he was the object of accusations. Hilarius, the emperor's freedman, had indeed brought this charge against him, that on hearing of the contest for the throne between Vitellius and Otho, he had made an attempt to secure power for himself, and to obtain possession of Spain, and that with this view he had not headed his passports with the name of any emperor. Some extracts from the speeches of Rufus he represented as insulting to Vitellius, and intended to win popularity for himself. So strong, however, was the influence of Cluvius, that Vitellius actually ordered the freedman to be punished. Cluvius was attached to the emperor's retinue. Spain, however, was not taken from him. He still governed the province, though not resident, as L. Aruntius had done before him, whom Tiberius Caesar detained at home because he feared him. It was not from any apprehension that Vitellius kept Cluvius with him. The same compliment was not paid to Trebellius Maximus. He had fled from Britain because of the exasperation of the soldiery. Vettius Volanus, who was then accompanying the emperor, was sent to succeed him. Vitellius was troubled by the spirit of the vanquished legions, which was anything but broken. Scattered through all parts of Italy, and mingled with the conquerors, they spoke the language of enemies. The soldiers of the fourteenth legion were particularly furious. They said that they had not been vanquished, that at the battle of Bedriacum only the veterans had been beaten, and that the strength of the legion had been absent. It was resolved that these troops should be sent back to Britain, from which province Nero had summoned them, and that the Batavian cohorts should in the meantime be quartered with them, because there was an old feud between them and the fourteenth. In the presence of such animosities between these armed masses, harmony did not last long. At Augusta of the Taurini it happened that a Batavian soldier fiercely charged some artisan with having cheated him, and that a soldier of the legion took the part of his host. Each man's comrades gathered round him. From words they came to blows, and a fierce battle would have broken out, had not two Praetorian cohorts taken the side of the fourteenth and given confidence to them while they intimidated the Batavians. Vitellius then ordered that these latter troops should be attached to his own force in consideration of their loyalty, and that the legion should pass over the Graian Alps, and then take that line of road, by which they would avoid passing Vienna, for the inhabitants of that place were also suspected. On the night of the departure of the legion, a part of the Colonia Taurina was destroyed by the fires which were left in every direction. This loss, like many of the evils of war, was forgotten in the greater disasters which happened to other cities. When the fourteenth had made the descent on the other side of the Alps, the most mutinous among them were for carrying the standards to Vienna. They were checked, however, by the united efforts of the better disposed, and the legion was transported into Britain. Vitellius found his next cause of apprehension in the Praetorian cohorts. They were first divided, and then ordered, though with the gratifying compliment of an honourable discharge, to give up their arms to their tribunes. But as the arms of Vespasian gathered strength, they returned to their old service, and constituted the mainstay of the Flavianist party. The first legion from the fleet was sent into Spain, that in the peaceful repose of that province their excitement might subside. The seventh and eleventh were sent back to their winter quarters, 
the thirteenth were ordered to erect amphitheatres, for both Caecina at Cremona and Valens at Bononia were preparing to exhibit shows of gladiators. Vitellius, indeed, was never so intent on the cares of empire as to forget his pleasures. Though he had thus quietly divided the conquered party, there arose a disturbance among the conquerors. It began in sport, but the number of those who fell aggravated the horrors of the war. Vitellius had sat down to a banquet at Ticinum, and had invited Virginius to be his guest. The legates and tribunes always follow the character of the emperor, and either imitate his strictness or indulge in early conviviality. And the soldiers in like manner are either diligent or lax in their duty. About Vitellius all was disorder and drunkenness, more like a nocturnal feast and revel than a properly disciplined camp. Thus it happened that two soldiers, one of whom belonged to the Fifth Legion, while the other was one of the Gallic auxiliaries, challenged each other in sport to a wrestling match. The legionary was thrown, and the Gaul taunted him. The soldiers who had assembled to witness the contest took different sides, till the legionaries made a sudden and murderous attack on the auxiliary troops, and destroyed two cohorts. The first disturbance was checked only by a second. A cloud of dust and the glitter of arms were seen at a distance. A sudden cry was raised that the fourteenth legion had retraced its steps, and was advancing to the attack. It was in fact the rear-guard of the army, and their recognition removed the cause of alarm. Meanwhile a slave of Virginius happened to come in their way. He was charged with having designed the assassination of Vitellius. The soldiers rushed to the scene of the banquet, and loudly demanded the death of Virginius. Even Vitellius, tremblingly alive as he was to all suspicions, had no doubt of his innocence. Yet he could hardly check the troops when they clamoured for the death of a man of consular rank, formerly their own general. Indeed there was no one who was more frequently the object of all kinds of outbreaks than Virginius. The man still was admired, still retained his high reputation, but they hated him with the hatred of those who are despised. The next day Vitellius, after giving audience to the envoys from the Senate, whom he had ordered to wait for him there, proceeded to the camp, and actually bestowed high praise on the loyalty of the soldiers. The auxiliary troops loudly complained that such complete impunity, such privileged arrogance, was accorded to the legions. The Batavian cohorts were sent back to Germany, lest they should venture on further violence. Destiny was thus simultaneously preparing the occasions of civil and of foreign war. The Gallic auxiliaries were sent back to their respective states, a vast body of men which in the very earliest stages of the revolt had been employed to make an idle show of strength. Besides this, in order to eke out the imperial resources, which had been impaired by a series of bounties, directions were given that the battalions of the legions and the auxiliary forces should be reduced all recruiting being forbidden. Discharges were offered without distinction. This measure was disastrous to the state, and distasteful to the soldier, who found that the same duty was distributed among a smaller number, and that his toils and risks came round in a more frequent succession. Their vigour, too, was undermined by luxury, a luxury that transgressed our ancient discipline and the customs of our ancestors in whose days the power of Rome found a surer foundation in valour than in wealth. Vitellius then directed his course to Cremona, and after witnessing the spectacle exhibited by Caecina, he conceived a desire to visit the plains of Bedriacum, and to survey the scene of the recent victory. It was a hideous and terrible sight. Not forty days had passed since the battle, and there lay mangled corpses, severed limbs, the putrefying forms of men and horses. The soil was saturated with gore, and, what with levelled trees and crops, horrible was the desolation. Not less revolting was that portion of the road, which the people of Cremona had strewed with laurel leaves and roses, and on which they had raised altars and sacrificed victims, as if to greet some barbarous despot, festivities in which they delighted for the moment, but which were afterwards to work their ruin. Valens and Caecina were present, and pointed out the various localities of the field of battle, 
showing how from one point the columns of the legions had rushed to the attack, how from another the cavalry had charged, how from a third the auxiliary troops had turned the flank of the enemy. The tribunes and prefects extolled their individual achievements, and mixed together fictions, facts, and exaggerations. The common soldiers also turned aside from the line of march, with joyful shouts, and recognized the various scenes of conflict, and gazed with wonder on the piles of weapons and the heaps of slain. Some, indeed, there were whom all this moved to thoughts of the mutability of fortune, to pity, and to tears. Vitellius did not turn away his eyes, did not shudder to behold the unburied corpses of so many thousands of his countrymen. Nay, in his exultation, in his ignorance of the doom which was so close upon himself, he actually instituted a religious ceremony in honour of the tutelary gods of the place. A show of gladiators was then given by Fabius Valens at Bononia, with all the arrangements introduced from the capital. The nearer the emperor approached to Rome, the greater was the license of his march, accompanied as it was by players and herds of eunuchs, in fact, by all that had characterized the court of Nero. Indeed, Vitellius used to make a display of his admiration for Nero, and had constantly followed him when he sang, not from the compulsion to which the noblest had to yield, but because he was the slave and chattel of profligacy and gluttony. To leave some months of office open for Valens and Caecina, the consulates of others were abridged. That of Martius Macer was ignored on the ground of his having been one of Otho's generals. Valerius Maximus, who had been nominated consul by Galba, had his dignity deferred, for no offence, but because he was a man of gentle temper, and could submit tamely to an affront. Badanius Costa was passed over. The emperor disliked him because he had risen against Nero, and roused Virginius to revolt. Other reasons, however, were alleged. Finally, after the servile fashion of the time, thanks were voted to Vitellius. A deception which was started with considerable vigour lasted for a few, and but a few, days. There had suddenly sprung up a man who gave out that he was Scribonianus Camerinus, that, dreading the times of Nero, he had concealed himself in Histria, where the old family of the Crassi still had dependents, estates, and a popular name. He admitted into the secret of his imposture all the most worthless of his followers, and the credulous populace and some of the soldiers, either from not knowing the truth, or impatient for revolution, began eagerly to rally round him, when he was brought before Vitellius, and asked who he was. As his account of himself could not be trusted, and his master recognized him as a runaway slave by name Geta, he was executed as slaves usually are. It would almost pass belief were I to tell to what a degree the insolence and sloth of Vitellius grew upon him when messengers from Syria and Judea brought the news that the provinces of the East had sworn allegiance to him. Though as yet all information was but vague and uncertain, Vespasian was the subject of much talk and rumour, and at the mention of his name Vitellius often roused himself. But now both the Emperor and the army, as if they had no rival to fear, indulging in cruelty, lust, and rapine, plunged into all the licence of foreign manners. Vespasian, on the other hand, was taking a general survey of the chances of a campaign, and of his resources both immediate and remote. The soldiers were so entirely devoted to him, that as he dictated the oath of allegiance, and prayed for all prosperity to Vitellius, they listened to him in silence. Mucianus had no dislike to Vespasian, and was strongly inclined towards Titus. Already had Alexander, the governor of Egypt, declared his adhesion. The third legion, as it had passed over from Syria to Moesia, Vespasian counted upon as devoted to himself and it was hoped that the other legions of Illyricum would follow its example. In fact, the whole army had been kindled into indignation by the insolence of the soldiers who came among them from Vitellius. Savage in appearance, and speaking a rude dialect, they ridiculed everybody else as their inferiors. But in such gigantic preparations for war there is usually delay. Vespasian was at one moment high in hope, 
and at another disposed to reflect on the chances of failure. What a day would that be when he should expose himself, with his sixty years upon him, and the two young men, his sons, to the perils of war! In private enterprises men may advance or recede, and presume more or less upon fortune as they may choose, whereas they who aim at empire have no alternative between the highest success and utter downfall. The strength of the army of Germany, with which as a military man he was well acquainted, was continually before his eyes. He reflected that his own legions were wholly without experience of a civil war, that those of Vitellius had been victorious, and that, among the conquered, there was more dissatisfaction than real strength. Civil strife had shaken the fidelity of the Roman soldiery, and danger was to be apprehended from individuals. What would be the use of infantry and cavalry, should one or two men seek the prize with which the enemy would be ready to reward a prompt act of treason? It was thus that Scribonianus had fallen in the days of Claudius, and his murderer, Volaginius, had been raised from the ranks to the highest military command. It was easier to move the hearts of the multitude than to avoid the single assassin. Though staggered by these apprehensions, he was confirmed in his purpose by others among the legates and among his own friends, and particularly by Mucianus, who, after many conversations with him in private, now publicly addressed him in the following terms. All who enter upon schemes involving great interests should consider whether what they are accomplishing be for the advantage of the State, for their own credit, easy of accomplishment, or at any rate free from serious difficulty. They must also weigh the circumstances of their adviser, and see whether he will follow up his advice by imperilling himself, and must know who, should fortune prosper the undertaking, is to have the highest honours. I invite you, Vespasian, to a dignity which will be as beneficial to the State as it will be honourable to yourself. Under heaven this dignity lies within your reach. And do not dread what may present the semblance of flattery. To be chosen successor to Vitellius would be more of an insult than a compliment. It is not against the vigorous intellect of the divine Augustus, it is not against the profound subtlety of the aged Tiberius, it is not even against the house of Caius Claudius or Nero, established by a long possession of the empire, that we are rising in revolt. You have already yielded to the prestige even of Galba's family. To persist in inaction and to leave the state to degradation and ruin would look like indolence and cowardice, even supposing that servitude were as safe for you as it would be infamous. The time has gone by and passed away when you might have endured the suspicion of having coveted imperial power. That power is now your only refuge. Have you forgotten how Corbulo was murdered? His origin, I grant, was more illustrious than ours. Yet in nobility of birth Nero surpassed Vitellius. The man who is afraid sees distinction enough in any one whom he fears. That an emperor can be created by the army, Vitellius is himself a proof, who, though he had seen no service, and had no military reputation, was raised to the throne by the unpopularity of Galba. Otho, who was overcome, not indeed by skilful generalship or by a powerful enemy, but by his own premature despair, this man has made into a great and deservedly regretted emperor. And all the while he is disbanding his legions, disarming his auxiliaries, and sowing every day fresh seeds of civil war. All the energy and high spirit which once belonged to his army is wasted in the revelry of taverns, and in aping the debaucheries of their chief. You have, from Judea, Syria, and Egypt, nine fresh legions, unexhausted by battle, uncorrupted by dissension. You have a soldiery hardened by habits of warfare, and victorious over foreign foes. You have strong fleets, auxiliaries both horse and foot, kings most faithful to your cause, and an experience in which you excel all other men. For myself I will claim nothing more than not to be reckoned inferior to Valens and Caecina. But do not spurn Mucianus as an associate, because you do not find in him a rival. I count myself better than Vitellius, I count you better than myself. 
Your house is ennobled by the glories of a triumph. It has two youthful scions, one of whom is already equal to the cares of empire, and in the earliest years of his military career one renowned with these very armies of Germany. It would be ridiculous in me not to waive my claims to empire in favour of the man whose son I should adopt were I myself emperor. Between us, however, there will not be an equal distribution of the fruits of success or failure. If we are victorious, I shall have whatever honour you think fit to bestow on me. The danger and the peril we shall share alike. Nay, I would rather have you, as is the better policy, direct your armies, and leave to me the conduct of the war and the hazards of battle. At this very moment a stricter discipline prevails among the conquered than among the conquerors. The conquered are fired to valour by anger, by hatred, by the desire of vengeance, while the conquerors are losing their energy in pride and insolence. War will of itself discover and lay open the hidden and rankling wounds of the victorious party. And indeed your vigilance, economy and wisdom do not inspire me with greater confidence of success than do the indolence, ignorance and cruelty of Vitellius. Once at war, we have a better cause than we can have in peace, for those who deliberate on revolt have revolted already. End of Book 2, Part 4